Welcome back, everybody. Uh, our next session coming up is, is my ZVM system full? Uh, which I think you're all going to enjoy. Uh, with us today, we have Brian Wade, a uh, friend and a colleague, a part of the IBM team here in Endicott, New York, uh, leading the performance evaluation team. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Brian. Okay, Bill, thanks very much. Um, I want to tell you a, mo a little bit about why it is that we wrote this presentation. Um, Bill and I worked on a crit sit, which both of us very, very well remember about a little more than a year ago, where a client had some difficulty with, I think it was processor utilization. And after we worked out the client's problem, he said to me, um, we want you to come and tell us how to figure out whether our system's full. And I asked him, well, what do you mean by full? And the client replied, well, I don't know what I mean by full. You need to tell me that. So that's how we ended up with this chart deck. And and I think it went over well about a year ago. We've given it a couple of times since then. So off we go. Just make sure I can page down. OK, good. So we're going to here's the agenda. We're going to take a look at what full means. And then I've tried to divide up the discussion about full into um, full on what kind of physical asset. Uh, are, are our processors full, memory full, is networking full, um, are we full regarding the links that connect the members of the SSI? Those are the uh, resource axes and we're going to try to talk about whether each one of those uh, is full and how we use Performance Toolkit uh, to take a look at uh, some of those things. So let's begin by uh, looking at uh, some different meanings for the word full. Um, I've shown here um, cores and processors, I've shown memory, and I've shown IO, and I've shown networking and ISFC. These are all physical assets your system has at its disposal while it's running. CPU power, for example, or processor power, um, channel power and device power, networking power, memory power, and so forth. And, and under each one of these categories, we can ask questions about whether the system is full on that axis. For example, Example, we can ask about whether the physical CPC or the physical machine is full when we talk about processor power. Under memory, we can talk about whether central, central memory is full. We can talk about whether paging space is full. Both of those are legitimate questions to ask about the notion of memory. Under I.O., we can talk about whether an I.O. device is full. In other words, can we can we do any more I.O. to it? Can we do I.O. more frequently? Or is the chip it full? Or, um, is spool space full? Is T-disk space full? These are all different definitions of the words full. And those there are corresponding questions under each of the other asset categories or resource categories. And we'll try to get through a good number of these uh, during presentation today. So uh, I want to begin by talking about um, whether processors are full. And I should tell you uh, one more thing is that what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use the ZVM Performance Toolkit and screens scraped from it uh, to illustrate the inspection of the system on all of these various resource axes. Uh, so you'll see a, a fairly large number of PerfKit screens, and I've tried to annotate them to show you where, where the numbers come from and what you're looking for, what kind of thresholds you're looking for, things like that. So let's begin by talking about processors. Before we talk about whether processors are full, we have to do a reset on our vocabulary with respect to processors. Prior to the uh, introduction of the Z13, we could, we as a community could be pretty informal about talking about uh, processor power and processor utilization. You might remember that we had lots of different words to, to use when we talked about um, CPU power, and I've already used two of them already on purpose, processors and CPU. Some of you might remember that we use the word engine sometimes, and others of you might remember that we have used the names of the types, like CPs or IFLs or what have you, to refer to uh, specific processors rather than uh, using those words only to talk about their types. So with the arrival of the Z13, I have at least found that I've had to be a lot more precise about my vocabulary so that I don't confuse the audience and so that I can have a, a good conversation with a with a partner uh, such as BIT. So, so here's a, a little bit of reset on vocabulary. Um, uh, the physical machine, like your, your Z15 Keck, has physical cores in it. 
Um, that Those are the things that you buy. Those are the things that are manifested in chips and then placed on books and what have you. It has physical cores. That's the word we use. And each one of those physical cores contains two physical processors. As Monty showed us yesterday, um, those two physical processors that ri reside on that single core share parts. And the idea that they share parts manifests heavily in when we study the SMT behavior of a system. But we have physical cores in the machine and each one of those physical cores has two physical processors in it. If your ZVM partition has not opted in for SMT, then the processors with which your partition is equipped are called logical processors and the PRISM hypervisor dispatches them alone on physical cores. That's what I've tried to illustrate here. The other half of that physical core goes unused. For example, when this logical IFL processor gets dispatched on this physical IFL core, its other half does not get used for any purpose. Um, similarly, for these logical CP processors, this partition has not opted in for SMT. When the partition opts in for SMT, either at SMT level one or at SMT level two, the entities with which the partition is equipped are no longer logical processors, they're logical cores. And we're gonna talk about that uh, on the next chart. Um, in SMT two, the IFL logical cores have two logical processors inside them. All the other types of logical cores have one logical processor inside them. This is very important to keep in track of because now we have two kinds of utilization, if you will, core utilization and processor utilization. And we're going to talk about the difference and where those manifest in PerfKit uh, in just a little while. So this chart is looks familiar to any of you who have ever set up a partition. This is a screenshot from the support element, and this is the editing of the activation profile, um, editing of the activation profile. And the reason I put this up here is because uh, you notice that the word processor is all over this window. Central processors, the title of the window is processor. This tab over here says processor. Um, I want to remind you that uh, here's number here's another processor and here's another processor. The entities with which you are equipping the LPAR our logical cores. Uh, in the degenerate case of non-SMT, you can think of them as processors, but if you're using SMT, remember what you're making here is cores. Now in the chat, somebody has said zips can have SMT too. That's true on ZOS, but it's not true in ZVM. Okay, so let's go to the next chart. Um, I had to put processor in quotes here because I needed a word to describe the entity that can complete instructions. And so I used processor, here, but I put it in quotes. Um, there are different, a lot of different ways you can run out of or be full on processor power. The CPC doesn't have any more power to give to the LPARs. The, your partition is being dispatched by PRISM as much as it can. Uh, the logical processors in your partition are full and a guest being completely busy, the guest can't run anymore. All of these are examples of, of ways that you can run out of processor. And in this column, I've tried to notate whether it's core power you're running out of or processor power that you're running out of. Um, and, uh, and then I've tried to notate uh, which, which of the PerfKit reports are, are primary for detecting whether you've run out of these various ass assets. FizzLog for uh, the CPC utilization, the LPAR report 126 for the partitions and so forth. And I'm going to show you examples of these various ones. So FCX302 or the FizzLog report is one of my favorite reports. This lets us see how full the keck is. This is a core utilization report. And up at the uh, top of the report, you'll see that there are some rows that are annotated by mean here on the left-hand side. And in red here, I've put the, uh, the situation with respect to the IFL physical cores. 81 are configured in this, uh, in this particular machine. And you can see that they're running about 7,200% busy uh, doing the work of partitions. About one third of a core altogether used for induced overhead in the in in Prism, and then about a half of a core used for unchargeable uh, Prism execution time. Some people call that LPAR management time. 
Um, I'm a little disoriented because my mouse cursor keeps disappearing while I'm trying to point to places on the chart. So I'll appreciate your patience while I deal with whatever that is. So, so over here in the total column, we can see about 73 cores worth of core power are being used on this 81 core um, machine. Um, one, a value of 100 represents one physical core's worth of power uh, being used. And you can see that I've put here the definition for full, and that is total divided by 100 is about close to the number of cores that are configured. And the IFL pool is closing in on full here. Um, dispatch of your own partition is uh, expressed, actually all the partitions are expressed in this report card called LPAR. Um, and what we've got here, I've tried to illustrate this LPAR called MSTL1. Uh, and I've illustrated two columns in the LPAR report, percent busy and percent overhead. If you add those two together, you get the total core busy that PRISM is charging to the running of this partition by core ID. That's what CID it means here. There are eight cores for this LPAR. So as busy plus overhead approaches 100%, then we uh, can conclude that, that um, this LPAR is being dispatched as much as it possibly can. We just can't run it anymore because we're running all of its cores 100% of the time. Now, if you happen to have dedicated partitions, you'll see 100% here all the time for the cores that are unparked. The parked ones, you'll see numbers that are somewhat less. Uh, but for, for the unparked ones, you'll see 100 here. And that's because PRISM dispatches the core all the time uh, in a dedicated situation, unless it's parked. Okay, so what I've tried to illustrate on this chart is something to help you understand the difference between core busy and processor busy. And here I've illustrated a partition, mperf1, and I've notated that it runs SMT2. I've tried to represent a logical processor in this partition by way of a bar, and I've illustrated the grouping of logical processors into logical cores by placing them inside a square like this. Prism dispatches logical cores on physical cores. And what I, I've tried to illustrate core dispatch with this blue curve on the chart. The heights of these curves are not interesting. They're, it's not an amplitude in the sense of an XY graph. It's just a step function to illustrate whether the core is dispatched or not. And I spaced them apart so you could see the colored lines more easily. So what this chart tries to illustrate is our core is, is dispatched for whatever it is, 60 units of time here, right? 60 units of time, our logical core is dispatched on a physical core, but the processors embodied within that logical core can move in and out of wait state independently. So when you look at something like the 304 PRC log report, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, what you'll observe is that the CPU or processor utilizations in that report don't necessarily match up to what you see in 126. And that be, that's because one of them is reporting core utilization and the other one is reporting processor utilization. These are two very different concepts and they're very important to understand in SMT2. And I've linked an article here that you can read. Okay, so in, in PerfKit, uh, these are the reports that talk about core busy, the FISLOG which we've looked at, LPAR and its friend LPAR, the weights and entitlements and counts of logical cores per LPAR, uh, those are all on 306. And then the PU config log, which describes parking, a good number of those numbers are core utilization. And the reason is that we park and unpark logical cores. We don't unpark and park logical processors individually. We, we park cores, that is we park processors pairwise. So that's why the utilizations are core utilizations on that chart. Over here, processor busy, uh, the 144 and then its replacement 304 PRC log. The system summary log has a single utilization number on it. That's the mean uh, processor utilization across all the logical processors of the partition uh, and so on. Uh, and then these three reports, 112, 162, and 288, these are uh, utilization reports for individual uh, users. In the chat, somebody mentioned they have difficulty deciding whether to use SMT2. I'm not gonna talk about that today, but uh, if you engage Bill, or uh, I'm sure we can put together a group of people to talk to you about that. So 304 PRC log is one of my favorites for looking at logical processor busy. When your LPAR has say eight logical processors in it, you'll see eight rows in here. This brings me to a vocabulary thing. How many people have 
uh, sometimes called their partition a four-way or a six-way. With SMT2, I don't like to use the word way anymore. And the reason is, I don't know whether that four-way means four logical cores running SMT2, or it means four logical processors. So that's another place where I've had to bend how I talk to make sure that people understand what I'm talking about. Um, uh, so I would call this a four logical processor LPAR. I would not call it a four way. I would also not talk about these as IFLs because uh, IFL alone might mean an IFL core or it might mean an IFL processor. So here we're talking about logical processors. PRC log shows the processor busy of each of the logical processors and full is, is illustrated by total approaching 100%. This is a good time to talk about what these what these numbers mean. Uh, Phil, I hear you. <laughs> I understand exactly what you're talking about in the chat. All right, so these different columns describe the percent of time the each of these logical processors spends in these various states. Uh, total is uh, CPU utilization altogether, user being time that's charged to users, and system being time that is used by CP but not chargeable to anybody. Um, because of the word system is so overloaded in our vocabulary, in our dictionaries, I began a few years ago talking about this as time induced in the control program and time that users did not induce but rather was overhead time. Um, so total um, user time is stuff that you can charge to users, either either because the user himself ran or because we're doing something in the control program on behalf of that user. System is unchargeable time, and emul is a fraction, a portion of user, which is pure uh, guest time. There's an awful lot of misconception in the community about this value called suspend. Suspend is just 100 minus what all these other ones are. It's the time you can't account for. There are two reasons why you would be unable to make the other five numbers add up to 100%. One reason is the logical processor is waiting in PRISM for dispatch. That's the one everybody thinks is, is prevalent most of the time, but that's not really the most important one. The second reason for suspend is the PRISM hypervisor is doing simulation for the control program because the control program ran a PRIVOP. Um, suspend in the perfect listing is, an, is analogous to what you Linux performance analysts call steal time. So this is processor utilization, and I tried to give you a reason or a, a metric you could use to tell whether it's full. When, when PRC log gets high, it's going to be one of these columns that gets high, emulation time, system time, suspend time, park time. And to aid your diagnosis, I've tried to put some questions over here. You can ask yourself about why it is that a given column in the PRC log report is high. Um, for example, if emulation is high, it means the guests are busy. If SYST is high, it means the control program is busy doing overhead work it can't charge to anybody else. And oftentimes that's memory management. Um, when suspend is high, there are a couple of things to look at. One of them is, is the control program doing a lot of PRIVOPs that PRISM has to simulate? Um, 239 report would show us that, but we've gotten really good at getting rid of those out of the control program. The other reason for suspend time is dispatch contention in PRISM, and usually that's because the partitions are not configured correctly with respect to their weights. There's a whole nother presentation about that. Um, park being high is not a, a cause for alarm. It just means we didn't want to use that core, so, so we parked it for whatever reason. Guest busy is another place where your, your system can fill. It's not the whole ZVM system filling up, but rather it's some guest becoming completely busy. And FCX 112, the user report, is a good place to look for that. Um, I've shown the column here in, uh, I've annotated the column header in red, percent CPU. This is the fraction of elapsed time that the VMD blocks or virtual CPUs for this guest were running uh, in total, percent CPU. 100 means one, one logical processor's worth of power is being consumed by that guest altogether. Um, one good question to ask ourselves is when, would this, when could this number be greater than 100? And the answer to that is, well, if the guest is a virtual four-way and it's keeping its four virtual processors completely busy all the time, then you might see a 400% busy uh, over here in the percent CPU column. 
So if, by comparing these numbers to what you know about the virtual configuration of the guest, you can come to some understanding about whether the guest is full. There are a number of other reports in PerfKit that talk about, um, that give us secondary indicators that we might be full on processor. For example, if guests are using Diagnose 9 Charlie or Diag 44, that's a sign that they're having difficulty getting dispatched and the partition might be full. And you would see that in 304 PRC log. Um, 239 Proxum, that if we see high Diag 9 Charlie rates in there, that would mean that we're having difficulty running with respect to PRISM. We've gotten pretty good at getting rid of those, uh, but sometimes it still happens. Uh, some people look at the user states report or the USTAT report, and they look for the percent of samples found where the guest is in a runnable state. Um, this means CP is not running them when you see that. Um, you look for high total busy as reported in PRC log if you saw USTAT very far off of zero. If you saw PRC log percent suspend very far off of zero, um, that means the logical processors are having a hard time running. And I would be looking at phys log there to see if the see if the keck is full. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about memory. Um, we just looked at a lot of numbers, lots of numbers with relate with respect to processor utilization. And I got to tell you a little story. I went to the VM workshop a few years ago when it was held at Ohio State University and the keynote speaker, um, a customer, got up and began to give his speech. And then the, that guy saw me in the audience and he said, oh, Dr. Wade from IBM is here. <laughs> and he looks out at the audience and he says, Dr. Wade is a man of few words and many numbers. And boy, that is just really true. Those of you who know me know I don't really talk very much, but I do like my numbers. All right, so so let's say, let's talk about memory and whether memory is full. Uh, there are lots of ways to run out of memory, just like there are ways to run out of processor. Um, you, can, you can begin paging, for example, and you can check the page log to see whether that's happening. You can run out of storage below the two gig bar. You can run out of storage above the bar. You can run out of space for page management blocks. There's just, there's just an, a very large number of different ways that the notion of running out of memory informally can show up in PerfKit. And I've tried to illustrate some of the PerfKit reports here. Uh, the available above the two gig bar report, for example, we're gonna look at some charts that have these reports on them. Um, and you might have noticed that each one of these sections starts with a chart like this, where, where we talk about a list of PerfKit reports and uh, what they show. I hoped that you'd be able to use those charts for triage on your own systems uh, sometime later after you're done listening to me talk. So um, the memory that's below the two gig bar in the partition is more precious than the memory above. There are certain data structures that can reside only on um, real frames that are below two gig. Um, a good example of this is data structures related to the performing of IO, especially IDAWs. So, um, whether storage below the two gig bar is full is interesting in and of itself. And the available below two gig report or 294 comments on that. I've shown this column group called available. This is the amount in bytes that is available below the two gig bar. And you've got an average of uh, 375K and, uh, in singles and 600K in contigs, roughly a meg altogether, I'm sorry, a gig. No, a meg, um, roughly a meg free below the two gig bar. This system is basically out of storage below the two gig bar, and that's what it looks like. Um, I want to caution you that the numbers in these columns are amounts in bytes. Uh, not very many frames left if you have only 601K free below the bar. Times empty over here is the amount of times we went to get memory from this region below two gig and we didn't find any, we had to do something. So, so here times empty per second being zero kind of means maybe we're almost out, but we have the need satisfied. Uh, if you see lots of times empty, then, then you're really in trouble. Similarly, uh, there's a report called A2, A2 above the bar. Uh, that's the 295 report. And this is the amount of memory that's available above the bar. And again, here, this is expressed in amounts. I wanna to apologize to you for this business that this report is done in terms of amounts, 
KB. Um, all the legacy perfkit reports, the amount of memory in various places is done in pages. Uh, on these reports, it's done in amounts, and we probably should have not let that slip through. It probably should have been done in pages here too for consistency. So just keep in mind of what you're looking at. Um, as regards how much central memory is in the partition altogether, I notated on the bottom here that there's a report called storage FCX 103, and it'll tell you how much storage is in the LPAR. Just look right there. Um, there's a data structure used uh, called a page management block or a PGM block. And we hold page memory, or excuse me, page management blocks in address spaces called PTRM address spaces. Each one of them is two gig in size and we create 128 of them when the system is free or when the system's IPL'd. So we have, oper we have 256 gig of address space to hold 4K page blocks. And if you multiply that out and you multiply by how many pages a page management block can map, you come up with some huge number for the amount of virtual storage we can address. Uh, it didn't used to be that way. Uh, it used to be that, that these page management blocks all had to fit below the two gig bar. They all had to fit below the two gig bar, and that severely constrained the amount of virtual storage ZVM could map. But in ZVM 5.3, we fixed that. Uh, the run up to 5.3 involved another crit sit that Bill and I uh, probably remember very well, at least I do. It was There was some contention there, but we fixed it in 5.3 and we haven't had any trouble ever since. So if you wanna know how, how full each one of these page management um, address spaces are, you can look out here to the right. I didn't include the actual numbers because you're gonna look and see the whole column. I just wanted to point you to the 130, 134 report and I wanted to point you to the names of these address spaces that hold page management blocks. The system execution space, um, how many of you knew that the control program runs with dat on? It has to because uh, in the old days, it was a 31-bit program, right? And so when we started exploiting st real storage that was larger than 2 gig, we couldn't just 64-bit eyes all the modules. Some of them are still 31-bit. And so for those modules to be able to get access to data structures that they need, and those data structures are above 2 gig in real, they have to run DAT on, and we use a 2 gig address space called the system execution space to map them. Um, I thought that was a pretty clever solution. That was done in... I think 5.1, maybe 5.2, I think it was 5.1. Um, there are, there's two gig worth of pages in the SXS. And what we're looking for is for the available pages to remain far away from zero. And in this case, they are far away from zero. I haven't ever seen a system in the wild that ran out of SXS. This is the time for somebody to type in the chat. Well, mine did, and I'd be interested to see your Monwrite data if, if you have one of those. Um, the set MDC cache command or set MD cache command can be used to configure the amount of storage, maximum amount of storage that can be used for MDC. And the 178 report or MDC store report comments on how many main storage frames are actually being used for MDC. So this is how you find out whether you're out of storage related to Minidisc cache. More and more clients are starting to use um, Linux guests that own their own FCP devices and talk to a SCSI uh, DASD controller, talk to their LUNs on their own. In other words, they're not provisioning with mini disks the way they used to. And so MDC is not as important as it was, say, 15 or 20 years ago. But we still have this report. And some clients still do put um, put their Linux guests DASD on mini disks. So, so still some use there. All right. The system summary log report is a good place to look for your first inkling of whether your system is paging. And the column is out here on the right. Paging rate per second, read plus write is a number that you're looking for. This system's turning pages at about 37,000 a second, read plus write. I've tried to point out a number of different perfkit reports where paging rates show up. Uh, for example, system summary log, which is on this chart. The page log report, 143, talks about the kinds of paging as a function of time. It's a log style report. And then 109, device CP own, shows paging rate per volume. So you can see, um, so you can see how how the volumes are being used individually. There are also places to see the activity of the memory manager. I'm going to talk about those too, the steel log report, and it points out an important number related to is my system uh, full. We're going to talk about that in a minute. 
whether my system is full in memory is also partly related to whether my paging space is full. We never want to run out of paging space. Bad things happen. Uh, but in this system, the paging space is about 57% full, and the fields in 109 device CP owned are right here marked in red. So you can go back and, and look at your system and see how that's doing. Planning and admin has a nice little write up in it to tell you how to plan how much spa paging space you need. So if that percent is running high for you or running hot for you, you want to review planning and admin and go over uh, your paging space uh, configuration. There are a number of other ways that we can quote run out of paging DASD. And on the next couple of charts, I want to talk about not the space consumed, but their abilities to do IOs. Um, in other words, are we doing as much I.O. to the paging DASD as we possibly can? That's a good way to for the system to be full with respect to paging. And what I'm looking at in particular on this report, this is 109 device CP owned. I forgot to mark this Q length uh, column in red, but what we're looking at here is a count of the number of pages that are either waiting to move or, or are in flight on each one of these paging volumes. You'll see these are device numbers over here on the left hand side. I personally do not like to see these queue length numbers anywhere above zero. When the system needs to page, it needs to page right away. When paging activity stands in line, then we have difficulty regarding performance. So I like to see these numbers uh, very, very close to zero. These numbers are very far away from zero. Uh, I know who did this run and that's kind of why they're that way. All right, so another reason to, or another way that your paging uh, IO can be full is uh, in terms of uh, how busy the volume is. Uh, we have a new report in, in uh, PerfKit. It's called the 329 report or the volume report. The, the, the volume report tells how each ECKD volume is doing regarding service time and connect time and all of that, um, accounting for the contributions by the aliases that can do IO to that base. So this is a volume view of the, of the disk, not a device number view of the disk. What I'm looking at here is percent busy. Uh, how many of you have ever seen a device more than 100% busy? You never have. If you looked in 108, you would never see that number above 100. And that's because you can do I.O. to only one device at a time. But here we can see that the numbers are well above 100, and that's because aliases are helping. Aliases are helping doing I.O. to this particular volume. And they're helping at a rate of this column right here. Um, for every I.O. done to a base, 1.82 IOs are being done to aliases to reach this volume. Um, and these are the service times for going through the base device and going through the alias devices uh, respectfully. So we can see that the aliases are helping. They've got to be helping because percent busy above, is above 100. So what we really need to do here is we need to take a look at the HP alias report to see whether we have enough aliases to do the paging IO we want to do. And that's on the next page. 327 HP alias, this is also a new PerfKit report. Notice that it tabulates the use of aliases by logical control unit. The SSID numbers are over here on the left hand side. And we can see that for the IO to our paging control unit, SSID 803, we are trying to get aliases at a rate of around 33,000 a second, but we're succeeding at getting aliases at only around 16,000 a second. So not only are our base devices full, we can't get enough aliases either. This machine is paging its brains out. Um, and this explains why back on 109, we saw pages queued at each one of those paging volumes. So uh, these three charts together give a pretty good illustration, I think, of how your paging system can be full, not in terms of occupation of space, but in terms of ability to do IO. Um, demand scan is the process of looking for what to eject. The memory, man memory manager um, runs this thing called demand scan, and, and this is how we find guest pages that didn't get used in a while, and they trickle down through the gal and so forth. Demand scan has the property that although it can run on any processor, it can run on only one processor at a time. Locking is used for that. So this number here, percent time active of demand scan, as it gets toward 100, it means that we can't exert 
ever consume any more cycles doing memory management. So you want to watch for this number getting close to 100. And when it is, um, we have some kind of memory problem that we need to look into. Now, regarding Linux, pay, or, correction, regarding the control program, paging a specific uh, guest, uh, here we've got the user page active activity report, FCX290. This is also pretty recent, and it shows movement of pages per second in each direction as a function of guest. The guest names are over here on the left-hand side, and then uh, how much we're doing um, in terms of movement uh, for, uh, for each guest. And I believe these numbers are in bytes, not in pages. The impact of this paging on the guests can be seen, for example, in the USTAT report, where we, where we can see the percent of samples where the guest is observed to be in page weight. If we're not seeing samples where the guest is in page weight, we have at least some clue that maybe paging is not having an adverse impact on the guest. I want you to remember that USTAT is not percent of time in a state. It's not percent of time spent in those states. It's the percent of samples in which the guest was observed to be in those states. We collect samples pretty seldom compared to how frequently a guest can change state. So remember, it's not percent of time. It's percent of samples, percent of samples. Uh, if a guest is doing swapping, I guess Linux calls that paging nowadays. Uh, that's another way that we could that the guest could be full. Uh, you can take a look at a lot of people use vdisks for guest paging extents, and you can take a look at whether a guest is doing I/O to the vdisk that you've provisioned for its swap device, and that would give you a clue that maybe the guest felt it were full. That's not really a control program full kind of issue. That's a guest kind of full issue, but nonetheless, I included it here for completeness. Um, we have a few minutes uh, left here, so we're going to talk a little bit about whether I.O. is full, uh, networking is full, and so forth. Um, I.O. being full, lots of different ways you can run out of I.O. A device can be completely busy. You can run out of hyperpav aliases. An FCP chipid can become CPU busy. A DASD controller can run out of cache. There are lots of different ways for I.O. to be full. Lots of different ways for I.O. to be full. Um, and these perfkit reports uh, talk about those various ways. Uh, so let's take a look at some of them. It's 37 past the hour, so I'm going to try to accelerate a little bit. Um, devices being completely busy. The 108 report is your friend here, FCX 108 device. Um, percent busy is over here on the right hand side. This number will approach 100, and when it gets up to 100, it means that the device is starting another I.O. as soon as the previous one completes. In other words, this is percent of elapsed time that the device is busy doing I.O. Um, if the device is an ECK disk, ECKD disk, maybe you can use aliases to drive more I.O. to the volume. We saw an example of that back in paging. Um, running out of aliases, we talked about this report too, right? HP alias 327. Um, here are the aliases for all the volumes in this logical control unit. And you can see that we're trying to get an alias to do I.O. to that control unit at a rate of 875, and we're failing at a rate of 763. These are per second. So we probably don't have enough aliases for this LCU. We want to see fails down near zero, and tries, of course, is whatever it is. These columns out on the right help to tell you where the peaks were, so you can relate that to something else you know about your workload. Uh, Chipids being completely busy. This is this doesn't happen quite as much as devices being busy, but the 215 or F channel report will tell you about that. Some of the ways that a chipid can become busy, it can become unable to move any more data, and it can become uh, unable to do any more bus cycles. All of those are expressed on the FCX 215 report. Um, mostly data units is what you're going to be looking at and bus cycles. We're looking for this to be up near 100 and data units, mo data moved to be up near the maxima that the chip had reports that it can move. 215 or F channel. And if a QDIO device being completely busy is expressed mostly by the 251 QDIO report, FCP devices uh, and uh, QDIO devices such as uh, network cards are reported on by, by the QDIO report. I should not have said FICON right there. I had to fix the chart. Um, write bytes and read bytes per second are what we want to be looking at there. 
uh, and we want to compare that to the card's capacity. How do how do I personally estimate the card's capacity? Whatever the bit rate is that is configured for the FICON card, you know, if it's, a, it's an Express 16 or whatever, um, I usually divide that by 10, and that's my mental um, uh, my mental boundary or barrier for the bytes per second that the card can move. For network cards, I, I prorate that by 85%. We'll talk about that in a little while. And EDEV being too busy uh, is usually seen on the 249 report, uh, which is unfortunately called SCSI. It really should have been called EDEV. Uh, percent connect approaching 100 is kind of the analog to FCX 108 device uh, approaching 100. This is what you want to look for regarding EDEVs uh, being too busy. DASI controller running out of cache is one that uh, we inside of IBM and the performance team anyway, seem to be pretty good at making happen. What we wanna look for here is the controller starting to express cache misses. And though you'll see those right down, right down here um, in the 176 report, the control unit report, you can see that per LCU, we report on the percent of read CCW chains that result in a hit in the read cache and the percent of write CCW chains that result in not having to access the disk drive in the DS8K. In other words, we found some NVS in which we could cache the write. We want these numbers all to be around 100. And you can see that the read cache in our controller is starting to suffer here. We're not doing very well regarding read hits and your applications will feel this. Uh, we want this number to be up near 100. Uh, the DASI controller, the DS8K, can also become too busy on CPU. Uh, we don't have any numbers in PerfKit that tell us the CPU busy inside the DS8000, but pending time being very far off of zero is a good indicator for that. The pending time per I.O. Is the, is the amount of time that passes from when the host, that's us, sends the I.O. down the channel to when the host receives back the control units, what's called initial response or IR. This is the control unit saying, I have your request, I'm gonna to get to it, and but I at least have it. If it takes a long time for the control unit to send back IR, that can be an indication that um, the control unit is experiencing high CPU busy. And so you'll see higher pending time numbers here. Um, if you see high pending time, you need to look at um, your storage performance analyst and ask him whether there's a CPU problem in the DASD controller. In general, any pending time greater than zero is cause for investigation. There are hidden processors in your Keck. They're called system assist processors and mostly they run the channel subsystem. Um, we wanna be looking for uh, the 232 report or the IO proc log report to see whether those processors are uh, significantly off of zero and percent busy. I've never seen these very high. In theory, this could go to a hundred and then there would be a problem. Uh, I've never seen an IO proc log report that showed me a problem on that. Another way IO can fill is you run out of spool space. You run out of dump space, you run out of T-disk space. These are all different ways that your IO can become full. And all of those are reported on FCX 109 device CP owned. You can just look and see the percent used. Just like page slots, you can see T-disk and spool slots used. Let's talk a little bit about networking being full. I know that it's 44 after. I'm gonna do my best not to eat too much into the break time. Um, you can run out of capacity on an OSA chip. -ed. You can run out of capacity on an OSA device. You can run out of capacity on a vSwitch uplink port. Uh, these are all different ways that you can run out of networking. Another way you can run out of networking is that guests that are critical to the running of your network infrastructure, namely the SSL worker virtual machines can become CPU bound. And I've tried to notate here the PerfKit reports that illustrate each of these things. We talked about FCX 215F channel already, so we should be able to go pretty quickly over that. Um, here's 215F channel, and you'll notice that it's commenting about an OSA chipid. Um, this OSA chipid, uh, the, the data bus is 61% busy, and 93% of its ability to carry data uh, is in use right now. Um, in, my, in my experience, other clients or people might have had different experiences. In my experience, the byte rate that you can achieve through an OSA card is roughly the 
card's stated bit rate divided by 10 times about 85%. This card is pretty close to what it can do. In fact, it's 93% of its stated capacity, which is which is pretty darn pretty darn good. So close to full on that OSA chip. An OSA device being full, uh, I use the same metric, the same mental rule for guessing. Uh, we're, we're pretty close to full on this one as well. 251 QDIO has the data rates out here on the right hand side. And I just look at the bytes read and the bytes written and compare those to what the card reports that it can do. Here's a handy little perf kit tip for you. This not very many people know this. These suffixes, the lowercase ones represent powers of 10 and the uppercase ones represent powers of two, 1024, um, 1048576, 5, and I don't know the digits for gig, probably somebody does. Um, a V switch being full is really just a question about whether its uplink port is full. So what we're looking for there is whether the OSA device being used for the uplink port for the V switch is full. Um, you'll notice that the numbers that are reported here are very close to what you'll see in FCX1, uh, excuse me, 251 QDIO. The numbers will be off by only just a little bit, and it's just extra, it's just protocol bytes that get counted in one place, but not, not in another. One little known report, about, uh, one little known fact about the vSwitch report is that it reports only the traffic on the uplink port. It does not report traffic that flows from one guest to another that are both coupled to the same vSwitch. You have to use the vNIC report for that, and those generally will not get full. Uh, when they're full, it, it would be because there's no CPU power available, and you'd see that in the PRC log report. Critical guests being full, there's a farm of SSL servers associated with your TCP stack, and the 112 user report would show you about that. We're just looking right here, percent CPU busy for the SSL servers, and you can see we've got one here that's 10% busy, and the other ones in our SSL farm are not busy at all. Uh, we'll take a look at ISFC links, and then we'll be done. We should finish in just a couple of minutes. Um, ISFC links are really important in the forming of an SSI cluster, right? That's the way we establish connectivity among the members of an SSI cluster. There are a few different ways that you can become full on a CTC. A CTC is a FICON adapter, right? So you can run out of bus capacity. You can run out of fiber capacity, and we saw already where to look on those. It's in the FCX215 F channel report. And uh, another way you can run out is uh, we just can't do any more I.O. to that channel to channel device because it's 100 percent busy. And we saw that in the 108 report when we looked at DASD, but I want to look at it in terms of uh, CTCs. So here's an excerpt of the FCX 108 device report, which talks about CTCA devices, real CTCA devices. And you can see they're doing a certain number of IOs per second. And you can see that these devices are each 98% busy. This is an ISFC logical link that consists of, I don't know, I think there are 12 devices here. And you can see that eight of them are almost completely busy. A couple of them are a little bit off of 100%. And then uh, the last two are barely busy at all. The reason this is like this is because ISFC decides automatically which of these CTCs should point from member A to member B and which of them should be used for member B back to member A. What was going on here was some kind of probably a guest relocation where we were trying to push a lot of guests over to the other side. So what we have here is CTCs that are very busy moving the guests that are being pushed and then just one that's only moderately busy moving the, re the responses or the acknowledgements back to the other side. This is business as usual, very, very normal for the set of CTC devices, which together make up an ISFC link. Um, to find out which device numbers, CTC device numbers are involved in your ISFC link, uh, you can use this ISF ISFL conf or configuration report 275. It'll tell you for your link to this partner node, you're using 12 CTC devices and these are their device numbers. So this is your index right here into the 108 report to find out how your link is doing. There's also an ISFL ACT report. I didn't talk about it in this presentation. So I'm sorry I went five minutes over. Um, I really get interested in numbers really, really a lot. And so it's hard for me to stop talking sometimes. This question our client posed to us, is our system full? 
is a very difficult question to answer. You have to figure out um, which resource you're talking about and then decide what full means in that context. That answer has two parts and it reminds me of a question that people have asked us over time. Um, does my system have good performance? Well, what do you mean by performance and what do you mean by good? Is my system full? Well, what do you mean by system? In other words, which resource are you talking about? And then what do you mean by full? You got to drill down before you can begin answering. Different report types require different techniques. And I've shown five different kinds of um, physical assets here. And I've tried to give you some guidelines with perfkit listings you can use to go in and check the behavior of those different asset types to find out whether they're full. So that's the end of my prepared remarks. I'm sorry I went five minutes over. You do still have 10 minutes of break. I'm happy to hang out and answer questions. Um, maybe I'll give it back to Bill now to moderate the question and answer session if there is any. Thank you, Brian. So uh, any questions for Brian? Uh, we'll take a couple here and then we'll, we'll go to break. Uh, either unmute yourself or uh, in the chat. There's a question in the chat. Um, could artificial intelligence be used to self-maintain an LPAR? Um, perhaps so, but I'm hoping that it doesn't happen in my lifetime. I would like to have a job for a few more years yet. <laughs> okay, so so uh, I'm, I'm glad for the thank yous that are showing up in the chat. That's cool. Um, I am a man of few words and many numbers, and I pulled together an expression of what I do with numbers in my off time. Some of you know that I do something uh, in my off hours away from IBM. So I will show you this. If you think, if you think your perf kit screen is interesting, you should try looking at this for fun. This is the instrument panel from my airplane. Uh, there's a, there are lots of different numbers here and I very seldom say anything when I'm looking at them. So few words and many numbers, how fast we're going through the air, how high we are uh, in the sky. This altimeter is showing us 5,500 feet, what direction we're going, how fast we're going over the ground, the whether the wings are low left or right or the nose is pitched up tons and tons of numbers on this instrument panel and that's kind of the reason why um, i like it it's a numbers thing i like the numbers on the perf kit screens and i like the numbers here too now this is only the left side of the panel it's only one third of the numbers that i get to look at i get to look at a bunch more numbers um, in the middle of the panel we have this display, which is a computer that monitors just the engine, just the engine, um, RPM, how much fuel it's using, all different kinds of things, where we're going, this is navigation, how fast we're going. It's, all, it's a lot of fun. Um, and in case you think that I'm done, that's only the center of the panel. I have even more numbers I get to look at in my spare time. This is on the right-hand side of the instrument panel. These are primaries and they just describe what the engine is doing. This is a tachometer, RPM, whether the alternator is doing what it's supposed to be doing, how much flow we're using, fuel flow, the temperature of the exhaust gas, oil pressure and temperature. Um, I look at numbers not only at work, but I also look at numbers for fun. Um, so that's kind of a window into, into me. Bill, we have six minutes left, and I think if you have the elevator music, uh, it's probably time for that. All right. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, Brian will be around. If you have other questions or comments, feel free to put them in the chat and we're going to go to a break. Mm -hmm.